Right, so um, essentially I was asked to um, give a talk um, with some sort of background to food allergy and hypersensitivity in the UK and also um, with a focus on what the FSA has been doing. It's been pretty active in this area, but sometimes that activity doesn't necessarily sort of bubble to the surface. Um, and so hopefully I'll sort of tick both boxes today. Um, so to start off, I think it's really important to be clear about what we mean when we talk about a food hypersensitivity or reaction or food allergy. And essentially um, we classify adverse reactions to food in this sort of way. They can be non-toxic or toxic. Toxic, for example, is food poisoning. If we dig down a little bit more into non-toxic, essentially there are reactions that involve the immune system, so this is food allergy, and reactions that don't involve the immune system and they are called food intolerances. And that's a really important distinction because in many people's minds the two are equivalent but they're not. While with food intolerances one can experience really debilitating symptoms such as for instance irritable bowel syndrome or something like that, those conditions are not life-threatening. Whereas with food allergy because of the immune activation that can result in significant risk to life. That's rare but it can happen. So within food intolerances, um, that can be divided into enzymatic issues or pharmacological issues or what we call other. Um, and so for instance, enzymatic, a good example of that is lactose intolerance. Um, some people have what we call primary lactose intolerance. They are born with, a, with less of an ability to process lactose, the sugar in milk. They don't have as much enzyme called lactase in their gut. And a result of that, when they get a bolus of lactose because they've drunk some milk or had a yogurt or something like that, the gut can't process that sugar. And so the sugar remains in the gut. And if you conjure your minds back to school and you might have learned about osmosis, because there's a big sugar load in the stomach and in the gut, that then sucks water into the gut. So you get bloating, that's uncomfortable, and then you can get watery stools and even diarrhea. And of course, that it results in a lot of symptoms of food intolerances. Some people get um, secondary lactose intolerance after a bout of gastroenteritis. So perhaps with many of you might be more familiar with that in the context of food poisoning and after a dodgy kebab or whatever it may be, you end up with a, with a couple of weeks potentially where you develop um, bloating and abdominal discomfort and loose stools after a dairy load. That also happens with young children. If young children drink too much juice, apple juice or whatever it may be, they overload the capacity of the gut to break down the sugars in the juice and it causes a similar sort of thing. There are also various sort of other causes of intolerances. Um, they can include pharmacological causes. So you might be on certain medicines that impair the ability of the stomach to break down sugars. It could be um, through a variety of other mechanisms. Some of you, if you're from the Far East, you might be aware that your alcohol tolerance isn't necessarily as good as some people who are white Caucasian from Europe. And that's because you lack an enzyme to help process and um, metabolize alcohol. So that's food intolerances. Food allergy involving the immune system, we can divide into two groups. There's what we call IgE mediated. Ig stands for immunoglobulin E, and that's an antibody the body produces. Um, usually we think to help fight parasitic infections, potentially it was there as well as a mechanism to protect ourselves against snake venom. But we've managed to develop this sort of immune response to things that really shouldn't bother the immune system, such as pollen, that causes hay fever, or to common foods and that causes food allergy. Alternatively, um, one can have immune activation that doesn't involve the IgE antibody and that gives rise to a whole range of food protein enteropathies, eosinophilic gastroenteropathies, and some classifications put celiac disease in there as well because celiac disease does involve the immune system. It's actually more of an autoimmune response as opposed to conventional food allergy.
So what's the prevalence of food allergy, which is the main focus of my seminar today? Oops. So various studies have been done and you can see sort of the rough figures up on your screen at the moment. In the UK, we're probably looking around two to three percent when it comes to school children, but there are are some allergies such as milk and egg that tend to be outgrown. And so by the time you want to end up in adulthood, that figure is probably near a 1%, 1 in 100. But then there are issues with how we diagnose food allergy. That our testing isn't as good as it we would want it to be. And so roughly 10 times the number of people who actually do have a food allergy think they have a food allergy. So for every person with true food allergy, there'll roughly be nine people who say they've got food allergy, but actually don't. They might have an intolerance or they might not have anything wrong with them at all. And the problem is that if you're feeling unwell, the first thing we tend to blame is something we've eaten or, or drunk, as opposed to some other sort of cause. Um, we're very quick to point the finger at food. Looking around the world, um, the best way to diagnose food allergy is what we call a, using a food challenge. This is where we give the person the food they're allergic to in small and increasing doses. We're trying not to kill the people, of course so that we can see if it elicits symptoms and that's because the blood tests or skin tests that we often use to help us diagnose food allergy aren't as good as we would like them to be and so for example of that if you're a baby and you have a positive allergy test for food you've got a one in two chance of actually not being allergic to the food were you to actually eat it um, and so this is why we tend to rely on these food challenges and you'll see that for the most part, food challenge to so the black bars tends to report lower rates than parental reporting or basing it on the history and an allergy test. The exception you can see that is Australia. This was a study that was done in infants where they used raw egg to detect egg allergy amongst other food allergies. And raw egg is very, very allergenic. And a lot of people, roughly one in 10 kids in Australia, if you give them raw egg, they will have a reaction. It's just by the time they get to preschool year, so two, three, four years, they've outgrown it. And that sort of message comes through here very clearly that looking at the UK, those black bars are all at the bottom. So the prevalence is roughly around 2% in those countries. If you then expand it to parental report using less precise measures, that percentage goes up. Now, pretty much any food can cause an allergic reaction. I've looked after a patient who developed anaphylaxis to parsley, among other food allergies that she had. But fortunately, um, the majority of reactions tend to be to these eight food groups here. And these eight food groups cause more than 90% of IgE mediated food reactions in children. So that makes our lives a little bit easier. And you'll notice many similarities between this list of foods and then what we call the Annex 2 list. So this is the current list of 14 allergens that under European and now UK law must be declared when present as an ingredient in a food item. And I'm choosing that language quite carefully as we'll see why in a few slides time. So for those to don't know the symptoms of allergic reaction are shown on this slide here. Essentially in the skin it can cause itchy rashes and usually relatively mild swelling. It's more prominent if that swelling is in the face such as puffy eyes, swollen lips. Cardiovascular in terms of the heart um, it tends to cause sort of a fast heart rate. It can drop your blood pressure and if your blood pressure drops sufficiently that causes shock, anaphylactic shock. Anaphylactic shock, as we'll see, is different from anaphylaxis, which is different from a normal food allergic reaction. It can cause hay fever type symptoms that many of us are suffering with at the moment. In terms of the lower respiratory tracts of the breathing, it can mimic asthma. And then within the gut, it can cause an itchy mouth, itchy throat, abdominal cramps, nausea, vomiting and diarrhea. Now, one question that is often the sort of elephant in the room is well okay food allergy is loads of it now but what about my generation 
there weren't that many kids when I was in school that had food allergy. Our parents' generation, even fewer, and so on. So why is it that, that food allergy has increased over the last 20, 30 years? So this is one area the FSA has been working in. I'm showing you this now just because it fits in. Um, the FSA was involved in a birth cohort from the Isle of Wight. Um, one of the good things about the Isle of Wight, um, I'm sure there are lots of good things about the Isle of Wight, so I should be careful how I'm saying this, um, is that the population tends to be much more stable than in other parts of the UK. And so there's an asthma allergy Research Centre, the David Hyde Centre at St Mary's in the Isle of Wight, that has been at the forefront of a lot of um, global food and asthma research, particularly that based in the UK for the last 20, 30 years. And they established three cohorts, some of which were part funded by the Food Standards Agency, one birth cohort in 1989, another around 95, and then another 2001, 2002. And at each of those three times, there are similar questionnaires, examinations, and skin testing, which is one of the allergy tests we use, um, to detect the possibility of food allergy. And if there's a suspicion families were offered this food challenge, the actual gold standard test to see whether there is food allergy or not. And so looking across these three years, one can see actually has there been an increase or not. So here, this is a positive allergy test to peanut. So back in 89, 1.3% of um, the cohort had peanut allergy at age three to four years. Around 95 it had increased to 3.3%, but then actually had dropped in early 2000s. And looking at actual peanut allergy, so this is where someone's reacted at food challenge, gone from half a percent in 89 to 1.4% around 95, and then 2001, 2002, 1.2%. 1 .2%. What explanations are there? for this increase. So there has been an increase, but actually that had probably leveled out by the time we turned into sort of 2000 onwards. Is it because we're eating peanut differently? Either it's in a different form or we're just our diet eating habits are different. Is there a change in how we're exposed to peanuts? So lots of um, medicines and creams used in children used to contain arachis oil, peanut oil. And that's now gone down with the increased awareness of peanut allergy. And perhaps that might have contributed to more peanut allergy for reasons that we'll talk about in a minute. Or has there been an impact from other allergic conditions? So many people in my generation have hay fever. And one of the things we wonder about is whether if you have some form of allergy, albeit not food allergy as a parent, does that somehow increase the risk of food allergy developing in your child? Probably one of the most um, significant and evidence-based hypotheses is this one, which came from uh, um, someone called Gideon Lack, a name some of you may be familiar with, who's Professor of Paediatric Allergy at uh, Guys in St Thomas's and King's College London. And Gideon's been very involved in FSA food allergy work over the last 20 years and has had received funding from the FSA. And around um, 20 or so years ago, began to put together um, this sort of story together with his colleagues and also other colleagues from around the world, often of which would happen at FSA sponsored meetings. And essentially the hypothesis is this, as a child, as a young child, as an infant, if you are exposed to food, down the oral route, so you eat food, then your gut is able to learn how to treat it as food and not something incredibly dangerous. And then you don't develop allergy, you develop tolerance. However, if you're exposed to the food, not by the mouth, but through the skin, so for example, you have eczema, or for example, um, you're ap applied with lots of creams that contain food allergens, whether that might be peanut oil or oat proteins, which some eczema creams have ironically, or whatever it may be, and that's not balanced by exposure through the mouth, then you don't develop that tolerance 
because you're being exposed to the food via an abnormal route and instead you develop allergy. And so on the basis of this, um, Gideon Lack and his team put together a study called the LEAP study, learning early about peanut allergy study. And what they did was randomize um, infants under 11 months of age to either regular peanut consumption by 12 months of age, and that was carried on for three years, or alternatively avoidance. And it's important to note that avoidance is not what we were doing in the UK at the time. Um, we were doing something in the middle. We generally weren't exposing our infants to peanut early, but we weren't waiting until three years for them to start wow. eating peanut, which is what was done in the context of a clinical study because things need to be nice and clean and straightforward in a clinical trial. And so in 628 infants, after three years, these children then went underwent food challenge. And in the peanut consumption group, 3% or so had developed peanut allergy. Obviously, they developed that at some stage in those three years. However, in the avoidance group, that was actually 17%. Now, these were high risk children, which is why that percentage is so much more than the sort of 2-3% I just spoke about with the Isle of Wight study. But that reduction in risk is massive, an 80% reduction in relative risk. You'd only need to give peanut early to seven babies in order to prevent one of them from developing peanut allergy, which is a very significant outcome for any intervention, whether it's for food allergy or medicine or anything. And so this was a very lauded study. And furthermore, um, in a follow on study, what they then did was stop the peanut. So if you'd been in a consumption group and eating peanut for the last couple of years, you then stop that for a year. And interestingly, the majority of participants went along with that. And the effect, this massive reduction persisted. So you can see here, 18.6% in those who were on avoidance versus 4.8% in those who were originally consuming every day, but then stopped. So that effect persisted. So coming back to symptoms, we'd already sort of described the sort of mild symptoms of allergic reaction. And sometimes that can be just localized, for instance, here, just to this child, where there's a little bit of lip swelling, and that's basically it. Or I'm gonna have a more generalized allergic reaction, but this still isn't a serious life-threatening reaction. So here, this is probably the most famous child in the world. Um, he's now in his, I think, um, late 40s, early 50s, and he lives in Brisbane. Um, he was photographed a long, long time ago, and you can see here he's got swollen, quite swollen, it's a little bit puffy in his cheek, he's got this itchy rash. This is a generalised allergic reaction, but certainly not life-threatening. Then we get on to anaphylaxis, and anaphylaxis is a serious allergic reaction that's usually quite rapid and may, in brackets, very occasionally cause death. And I'll show you the data on why I qualify that. And it's important to realise that actually Anaphylaxis essentially is just an allergic reaction that involves the breathing or the ability of the heart to pump blood around the body. And most of the time it's self-limiting and most of the time will not cause death. But very occasionally it will cause very severe reactions which can be life-threatening and can result in intensive care admission or even death. Now, many of you, I'm sure, haven't actually witnessed an allergic reaction, let alone anaphylaxis. I'm just going to quickly show you this video, which is a young baby having anaphylaxis to milk, and hopefully this will work. It's 8.40 a.m. and you've just had five spoons of yogurt. So here he's okay. wondering what's going turn on. It off now. And listen carefully at your end down. Yeah, turn around so I can see. So you can see he's got breathing noises. <laughs> Looks a little bit puffy. He's much less active. He's red in the face. This is a mild anaphylaxis reaction because that, that those breathing noises that he's got is increased secretions, maybe a little bit of airway narrowing. And that's why we're now hearing that extra noise when he's breathing. So that's anaphylaxis. But actually, while anaphylaxis is relatively common, 
Dying from anaphylaxis is very rare. And this is some work that colleagues of mine led by uh, Robert Boyle here at St. Mary's Hospital in London and Imperial College um, led on around um, seven, eight years ago. And essentially what we did was find out the likelihood of bad things happening to you if you are a young person or an adult with food allergy. And then we compared those bad things to bad things happening to you because of your food allergy, i.e. having anaphylaxis. So starting off over here, generally if you're a young person, one in five will have to go to A&E at some stage in any one year. One in 10 will go to A&E because you've broken an arm or leg or something like that. It run round one in 200 will go because of an accident involving a car. Dying from any cause, so about one in 5,000 in the USA, a little bit less in Europe. Dying because of an accident, one in 10,000 in the USA, you get the picture here, about one in 50,000 um, death due to murder in the USA, that's less in Europe, that's probably something called gun control, but I'm not allowed to say that because it's a political statement. And then dying from a lightning strike, one in 10 million. Now, what about a bad thing happening related to your food allergy? So roughly one in 10 will say, yes, I've had food anaphylaxis. Come to see someone like me, about one in 10 of those, actually I'll agree with them, and nine out of 10 I'll say, actually it wasn't anaphylaxis. It was a mild reaction or some other cause of, of symptoms. Being admitted to hospital because of that anaphylaxis, about one in 10 of those. And maybe if you get admitted to hospital, that can be used as a marker of severity, because if you've just had a mild anaphylaxis reaction, you're less likely to be admitted. Dying from anaphylaxis, about one in quarter of a million. And so actually, if you cut out your emotions and deal with these data as a statistician, my patients are more likely to die from coming to see me for their annual checkup in hospital because they've been involved in a motor accident than they are because of their food allergy. However, that has to be caged appropriately because I don't want to get it reported to the GMC. I don't tell my patients that. And I say this as a father of someone, of a child who's had anaphylaxis. What this means is that yes, you're very unlikely to have anaphylaxis, but the reason for that is because you're not eating the thing you're allergic to and you've got rescue medication and you know what to do if you have a reaction. And we need to treat that safety netting in the same sort of way that we treat safety netting. That makes driving a car or crossing a road okay. So just like you don't get in any car, but you get in a car that's been safety rated and it's got an airbag, and you put your seatbelt on it and you follow the highway code in much a similar way that we have that safety netting that makes everyday risks more acceptable we need to think how can we safety net for food allergy and that's where the fsa would obviously come in but we are left with the problem that if i tell a parent what are you making a fuss about your kid's got one and a quarter million chance of dying stop wasting my time i will get reported to the gmc or at best, I'll think I'm a blooming idiot. And the reason for that is because as parents and as individuals, a risk of one in quarter of a million doesn't mean not very much. It means my child or I am that one in a quarter of a million. And that's why food allergy causes so much adverse impacts on quality of life because it drives anxiety, because there's a lack of control. You don't know what someone is giving you, what food someone's giving you, whether it's safe or not. And you are aware, even if it's incredibly rare, that there is a potential risk of fatality, of dying from your allergy. And so while anaphylaxis isn't uncommon, death is very rare, but we might not realise that. Many of you will recognise this face here, this is Natasha Ennen Lapouse, who died in 2016 on board an aeroplane to France after eating a baguette that contained sesame um, purchased at Heathrow Airport. And not the charity that's been founded by the family, um, recently commissioned some data from NHS Digital um, to look at 
the prevalence of admissions to hospital due to severe allergic reactions. And we need to be careful when we see data like this. We have been analysing the same data and um, luckily, fortunately for us, we've got access to the raw data at the back door, whereas they just said to NHS Digital, how many reactions have there been in this year? And when you look at the actual raw data that's available, this is what it shows. So yes, there has been an increase, but there's been an overestimate and we're not quite sure why that is because we don't know exactly what the data request originally from the charity to NHS England was. And actually, this is shows the data over the last 20 or so years. Um, England here, this is the UK, but actually it's English data because NHS Digital now, because of the evolution, only gives us access to data from England easily. And you can see that, yes, there has been an increase in admissions, a threefold increase roughly over the last 20 or so years. And that trend is also reproduced elsewhere around the world. But if we look at fatality, actually it's good news. And it's not just good news in the UK, but even in Australia where fatalities have been increasing, the fatality rate, the proportion of anaphylaxis that results in death due to food has actually been dropping. So you can see here, we've got a similar rate and actually we're now approaching the very low rate in Australia where I would argue um, there's more awareness of food allergy and more appropriate management of food allergy, particularly um, by initial emergency medical services and in primary care. There are some other interesting things in the UK data as well. So this is the fatality data due to food anaphylaxis in the UK between 92 and 2007. And what's really interesting here is that if you look at children, the most common cause of fatal anaphylaxis, albeit we're talking very small numbers, is milk. It's not peanut. And so if we dig a bit deeper, one can see that around one in four deaths in children is due to milk. And that's actually more common than any other single food allergen alone. And one in 20 deaths in adults, which is also pretty high because milk allergy in adults is pretty rare. And you can see this rather concerning trend of the increase in fatalities due to milk in the UK. And actually it, it, due to nuts is dropping. And that's probably because there's much more awareness about peanuts and nut allergies now but people don't realise that milk is a major killer as well. People assume milk allergy is quite mild, and often it is, but not if you're still a school child with milk allergy and you haven't outgrown it. The other risk is, again, the concerns that people have to pre-packed foods. So one in four deaths in the UK have happened due to purchased food. And as far as we know, that's almost always due to not reading the ingredient properly. Very rarely, if at all, has that been due to the presence of an allergen in the food that's been bought from a supermarket and not declared. As opposed to 60% of deaths that have been caused by purchasing food from catering outlets or by caterers at wedding celebrations, for example, or takeaways or what have you. Now, management of food allergy involves not eating what you're allergic to, having a plan such as this one, which is the UK plan for children with food allergy, and having rescue medicine, which is usually injectable adrenaline, so that if you do have a severe or an anaphylaxis reaction, you've got an, a bit of something that you can do immediately to try and reverse that. But all of these options aren't actually a treatment for food allergy. You still have food allergy at the end of the day. They're a management strategy. And many of you may be aware that at the moment there are a number of studies going on to actually do something called immunotherapy to try and treat people with food allergy so that they're no longer allergic. And the problem that we have is that having a diagnosis of food allergy means it takes longer for you to shop, it costs you more because you generally can't buy the cheaper budget foods. They tend to have more may contain labels often. And that results in the situation where if you're a parent of a child with food allergy, your quality of life is less than 
if your child had diabetes and required four or five injections of insulin every single day. And if you have multiple food allergies, there's a risk of compromised nutrition that can affect growth, and of course, the risk of fatality. Now, I'm just going to show you this video to hopefully give you more of an idea of the impact um, that this has on the families. Hi, my name is Izzy and I've got anaphylaxis, which is an illness where you're so allergic to something that you eat or come in contact with the item. Your body will automatically say, oh no, I don't like that. So you'll get like a shaky feeling and your mouth goes a bit dry and then your tongue starts to get really, really sore and it tingles. And then your lips will start swelling up and you'll get hives all over you and then uh, I got a really really bad headache and a tummy ache so um, I'm severely allergic to nuts. Hi I'm Ben, I'm allergic to shellfish and kiwi and I'm anaphylactic to Brazil nuts, cashew nuts, peanuts, all of nuts. So we were having a meal, me and my sisters, and my mum had made it and I had some and at first I felt fine and I said oh I really like this and then next is that I was upstairs outside my mum's bedroom and she was calling an ambulance and then I remember getting in the ambulance and they had to give me uh, mask so that I could breathe. I get really really anxious if I go to a market or something I get really really scared and I normally just kind of tuck myself up and away from everything on the sides because anything basically anything could happen. Like if I if we went to a restaurant and they hadn't cleaned the tables and somebody was eating nuts beforehand I would be likely to have a reaction if we're on a plane or something. If somebody's eating nuts next to me, I will probably get anxious still. Sometimes I feel really safe because sometimes they announce there's no nuts serving on the plane and then they end up having nuts. So you get really annoyed. So they gave me a face mask it was so that no nuts in the air could get into my system. So it was really annoying. <laughs> Sometimes some people have sleepovers and say, oh, Izzy, you can't come because we're going to have a Nutella for breakfast and mm. stuff like that. And it makes me feel really upset. And it's like I can't help it. It's just how I am. I have to bring an EpiPen around with me everywhere and an EpiPen is where you get it out and you put it on a part of your body and you hold it there for 10 seconds then you take it out and just slide them down and see if it's worked if it hasn't let's give them a second one and that will probably work you kind of gotta trust your instincts so if you read something and you think, oh, it says may contain nuts, it looks a bit nutty and you think, can't eat that. It's weird because whenever I'm near a nut or something, I can sense it. You get a thing in your body that's kind of going round and round and it's telling you, oh, don't, 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 don't. You just get a voice in your head saying, Izzy, don't go over there, don't, don't. And you kind of get like a, a butterfly feeling through your body. It was my birthday party and it was chocolate ice cream and as soon as I looked at it I said I can't have it. So luckily that saved my birthday of my whole life. So. so that brings us on to 
allergen labeling, which was flagged up in that video as a potential issue for many people with food allergies. Now, currently under UK and European law, um, if a Annex 2 allergen, which I showed you before, one of those 14 allergens is present as an ingredient, it must be declared in pre-packed foods. And the law is actually different across different countries, which is important for people when they're traveling abroad, pre-COVID and maybe post-COVID in five years time to remember. Um, simply because while there are some standard allergens that are declared throughout most of the countries of the world, in some places those allergen lists are actually different and local legislation is different. So for example in Japan the legislation is different for many food allergens from elsewhere and also in America wheat must be declared but not other gluten containing cereals although that may be changing and so as a result of that people will often get caught out if they have non-wheat allergies. Um, and so this is something that Obviously, we need more consistency globally because global food supply is really what we're talking about now, which is, you know, very clear to a lot more people than perhaps it was uh, six months ago. Now, the law changed in 2011, um, whereby instead of having a sort of warning contains these allergens box or don't eat if you've got this allergy, um, instead the allergens would have to be listed in the ingredients and highlighted as well and there are stipulations over how you might highlight it in bold or something like that. And so you may well have sort of seen um, over the last sort of six, seven years the ingredients changing. However, you will also have noticed these sorts of labels as well and these labels are not legislated for. And so this is completely voluntary. Companies don't have to put them on or if they do put them on, they don't have to justify why they're necessarily using them. And this has a significant impact on the consumer. So again, this is some FSA commissioned research that up to two thirds of cereals and over half of confectionery labeled may contain, doesn't actually contain the nut as an ingredient, but still has a may contain label. Shopping takes longer, it costs more, and it impacts on quality of life. And we end up in a situation that sometimes there'll be a product with a may contain label because there's a risk assessment that's been done and there's a conclusion that there is a risk despite adhering to good manufacturing practice GMP. Alternatively, that product doesn't have a label, but the same risk assessment has been done. There's no way for the consumer to distinguish between these two, apart from the presence of a PAL label. They don't know if there's no warning. Is there a reason that there's no warning? And if there is a PAL, it may also be because there's no proper risk assessment done and actually the manufacturer is just covering their backside or alternatively there has been a risk assessment but for some reason there's a risk averse culture within the business this is something that we think has probably increased more as um, European food producers have been bought up by non-European companies that are more risk averse and therefore, the power is still there, the warning is still there. Or sometimes there's no warning and actually there is a significant risk. And so because the consumer can't distinguish between these options, that causes a lot of confusion. And it's therefore not surprising that most people might avoid, but not all, will avoid something that says may contain nuts. But if it's a little bit more loosely worded, may contain a trace of nuts, only around half of people avoid that with food allergies. And if it says, well, it doesn't really contain nuts, but we make it in the same building as a factory where there are nuts present, actually the majority of people don't avoid that food. But we also know from work that the FSA has funded that the amount, the actual risk because of accidental presence of allergens does not relate to the wording employee. And, and you cannot assume that a more wordy may contain label implies less risk. And so the reality is there are wide inconsistencies in labeling. But the problem is foods can become contaminated with residues at multiple food points. So harvesting, storage and transportation, the manufacturer share using shared equipment. 
And there aren't uniform measures across manufacturers to reduce that potential risk of cross-contamination. And while there's a drive from the consumer for cheaper foods, manufacturers will often not cut corners, but they perhaps will say, well, we're going to use shared equipment because that's how we can deliver cheaper food. And we'll have just have to say may contain, rather than shut down a production line, do proper formal clearing, cleaning that can take hours and has significant cost implications so that they don't have to have a may contain label. And so it's a really difficult situation for food businesses to manage. And this is on a big factory scale. We haven't even dealt with smaller food businesses and takeaway outlets and so on. I think the other really important thing is to realise that the word trace is nonsense when it comes to food allergy. So what is a trace? A trace is something that you cannot see and you cannot measure. Now in the top row here are the amounts of milk, egg, wheat and so on that would cause an objective allergic reaction in 5% of the people with those allergens. And here are the same amounts that will cause a reaction in 100 of those people. And you can see those with the naked eye. You do not need to use a microscope and you can measure them. So that's not a trace. And so when something says may contain traces, what does that actually mean? That's another cause of confusion. And if we ask consumers, what actually do they want when it comes to labelling? Their pre preference is for a label that says, if you have X allergy, don't eat this. But that's now illegal under EU and now UK legislation. So what's the FSA been doing in this area? So some of you may have seen this um, headline in the middle of June where the uh, Natasha and Anna Peru's charity, um, the research um, charity, the research foundation, um, had, did a press release. And this is in the context, of course, of Black Lives Matter and concerns over um, members of, of the BAME community in terms of coronavirus and COVID-19. And the charity put out a statement that said there's very little research into allergies in the UK and that research is woefully underfunded. But actually, over in, in a report from a House of Lords um, commission in 2006 and 2007, found that a reasonable amount of funding had actually been spent on food allergy research over the preceding sort of 10 or so years. And this might not be enough, but it's not peanuts and no pun intended. We're talking about a couple of million on food allergy, and then there's been EU funding for another couple of million every single year. And then of course, the FSA programme, which has been the Food Allergy and Intolerance Research Programme. So let's come to this specific program. This was established by the um, Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food, as it was then called, back in 1994, to investigate causes and mechanisms of severe food allergy, particularly with reference to peanut allergy. And to date, so in the last sort of 25 years, over 20 million pounds has been spent and over 50 research projects commissioned. And there's a good summary for those who want to access it. That was published 10 years ago in Toxicology, a journal. Um, a lovely summary by Jael Su and Ian Kimber, who for the last sort of two plus decades has been one of the external advisors to the, that research program. And I'm just going to give you a brief taster over the next sort of five minutes. So I've already mentioned the Isle of Wight cohort studies, which is how we know um, the prevalence of peanut allergy in the UK and the fact that the epidemic, if you can call it that, probably happened around 30 or so years ago, and we're no longer in an epidemic. We do have highish rates of food allergy, one child in every class in the UK, but certainly I wouldn't say that's epidemic proportions. And there have been some other consequences of that data as well. Um, around the same time that one of those cohorts happened, around 2000, there was a change in pertussis vaccine used in the infant vaccine programme from wholesale pertussis to acellular pertussis, which probably doesn't mean very much if you're not an immunologist. Um, but there has been a concern that potentially that switch could cause a trigger in the immune system that makes you more susceptible to food allergy. 
And so using that data that was funded by the FSA, we were able to show that there was no obvious increase in the rates of food allergy or food sensitization due to that important switch in the childhood infant immunization program in the UK. So that's just one example of a secondary outcome from FSA funded research. There's also research ongoing at the moment to look at how we can better use NHS data sets to monitor trends in food hypersensitivity and anaphylaxis. And there's also work ongoing that very shortly next few months, we're hoping to launch an anaphylaxis registry. So if someone has anaphylaxis and reports to a medical facility or to a clinic or to their GP, the circumstances of that reaction can be logged so we can learn more about what is actually having, happening in the community and what the risk factors for more severe reactions are. What about allergy prevention? Um, so in the 1980s, the recommendation from the Department of Health was to aim to breastfeed to four to six months of age and to introduce solids from three months of age. But as WHO, the World Health Organization, started to um, support exclusive breastfeeding to six months of age, that advice has changed. And in 94, um, the rather unfortunately named COMA committee, which is a committee on medical aspects of food and nutrition, um, no longer exists, it's been subsumed as do other committees, um, recommended delaying allergen introduction until after six months of age. In 1998, COT, the Committee on Toxicology, a specialist committee of the Food Standards Agency, recommended that women with an allergic type background avoid eating peanuts in pregnancy and when breastfeeding, and children shouldn't be given peanuts until after age three years. And the reason for that came from an increasing number of reports that babies and young children were having allergic reactions to peanuts the first time they were given peanuts. And thinking immunologically, that's just not possible. The way the body develops allergy is that first of all, it has to become sensitized. You have to be exposed to the food first so it can make the IgE antibody. And then on second exposure, you then have the antibody that can trigger the reaction. You shouldn't react the first time. And so with the reports of people reacting at first exposure, the implication was that they must be exposed to it before that. And maybe that was happening in utero when they, when they were a baby, when there were fetus inside their mothers. And that's why that advice came through. What wasn't clear at the time was actually the exposure could be happening through the skin rather than down the mouth. And that was why we were seeing an increase in allergy. And so in 2008, when more data came out to show that avoidance wasn't good and also exposure wasn't happening during pregnancy and also exposure could happen through the skin to trigger sensitization, which can then lead to food allergy, that advice was reversed. The problem is that people don't always listen to advice and we're very much seeing this message at the moment in terms of um, COVID-19 and whether people are wearing masks or not wearing masks and having trust in the government advice or, or, and so on. And this is again some work that was funded by the Food Standards Agency where they found that actually the majority of pregnant mothers don't follow official advice when it comes to allergies. At least they didn't back then. Now, I mentioned the LEAP study, which was a study that was done to see whether earlier introduction of peanut could reduce peanut allergy. But the Food Standards Agency also published a more pragmatic study that was done by the same research group called the EAT study. And the idea here was to recruit exclusively breastfed infants from three months of age and randomise them to either eat foods from six months onwards, as you would normally do, or alternatively, eat six allergic foods. So we've got peanut, egg, milk, sesame and fish and wheat from three months of age. So eat it earlier and does that reduce your risk? And unfortunately, in this more pragmatic study in a lower risk group, which this was, it wasn't significant. So yes, 5.6% were allergic. That is less than in the standard introduction group, but that difference wasn't significant. But if you look at actually, it was all very well giving people advice, they followed the advice. So the people in the early introduction group, did they actually introduce it early or not? 
and the people in the standard introduction group, did they not introduce it, then the difference was significant. And it's significant for peanut, and it was also significant for egg. And then in the further analysis, again, funded by the Food Standards Agency, they found that even at what we call the intention to treat, so the, so the highest level of statistical purity in comparing those two groups, in children and infants who are at high risk of developing food allergy, there was a significant difference in the development of any food allergy and egg allergy. And so this is UK specific data in the slightly more pragmatic context that has, in having those foods earlier by what 12 months of age can result in a much lower risk of developing food allergy to those foods. And as a result of that, the guidance has changed in the UK. We're not pushing allergen interruption before six months in the general community, but we are saying don't delay. Once your child hits around six months of age, don't avoid giving them allergens and be careful because some will still develop food allergy. Another area that the FSA has been very active is in is in allergen labelling. And in 2014, they published a study that they had commissioned where they looked at 508 food products purchased from UK supermarkets to say, well, actually, can I find gluten in this food? Is there milk in this food? Is there hazelnut? Is there peanuts in this food? And then they looked at whether the foods said may contain peanut or milk or not. And then, of course, in all those foods, the food, these allergens weren't declared as an ingredient. And you can see that the majority of foods did not contain the allergen that was declared or not as it may contain or not declared at all, which is very reassuring. And it was pretty good for peanut. Hardly any foods were identified that contained um, peanut protein. Slightly less good for hazelnut. The milk, as I'll show you in a minute, were often confectionery items and desserts, um, and we'll talk about those. And then gluten was perhaps the biggest issue. And in the further analysis, that was facilitated by the FSA um, with a group um, in the Netherlands. We then looked at, well, actually, what's the likelihood of you having a reaction way to eat that food? And so the issues, the higher risk foods were milk chocolate and dark chocolate, and that's partly due to how um, those foods are produced. You cannot clean chocolate machines with water. For those of you who have melted chocolate at home, if you get water in it, you ruin it. And so when you are cleaning a chocolate line in industry, you actually clean it with chocolate. So you put a chocolate line through. And if you go to Bourneville, I can't mention the company, you can buy those misfits. Often those misfits come from those cleaning runs. And we know from similar that have been done that dark chocolate around one third in three dark chocolate products will still contain traces, sorry, I mustn't use that term, low allergen levels of milk, which in some people between sort of 0.1% and as, could be as high as 10% or even 50% in this product could be enough to trigger an allergic reaction. And that's why people with milk allergy must not have dark chocolate where it may contain small amounts of milk has a may contain label on it. The other products for vegetable samosas, cereal bars, these were for um, often sort of wheat contamination as well as milk, and Indian ready meals as well, often contains high levels of gluten such that one in 10 to one in five people with wheat allergy could have a reaction to those. And so finally, um, there's still a lot of work to do. And one of the reasons that the Science Council for the Food Stamps Agency is con currently conducting a review is so we can help provide advice to the FSA in terms of fulfilling this dream, this, this objective that Heather Hancock explicitly said in a recent board meeting, that the UK should become the best place in the world for people living with food hypersensitivities. I'm going to stop there. And I'll be delighted to take the questions on chat. Thanks, Paul. That was a really um, engaging talk. I think I've got a little bit of echo coming through. Hopefully you guys can't hear it. Uh, we did have one question through while you were speaking, um, which was 
um, is there any research on showing if allergies can be passed down through generations? For example, if I have a nut allergy, will my children too? So we used to think yes, but actually um, we have now sort of tightened that up a little bit such that there is more of a risk in your children if you as a parent have an allergy, but that's not food allergy, that can be any allergy at all. So you're not more at risk, if you have a food allergic parent, you're not more at risk of passing a food allergy onto your child than if you have hay fever or a drug allergy or something like that. Um, the other thing um, that um, we're also increasingly learning more about, and this is Australian data, is that we used to think if there's a child already with food allergy, any other brothers or sisters are at higher risk. But we now think that that is mainly because the parents are understandably anxious that the sibling might have food allergy and therefore delay introducing those foods into their diet, which we now know is a risk factor. And so we think the increased risk we see in brothers and sisters of people with food allergy is actually because they don't get exposed to those food allergens early enough in their during sort of introduction of solids. And that's why there's an increased risk. It's not due to genetics. So it's something that we're still teasing out. But as I can sort of given you some of the explanation, it's actually quite complicated. It's partly genetic, but environmental exposure or non-exposure is also really important. Great, so the next question was, um, are people allergic to some foods at a higher risk of developing anaphylaxis to certain therapeutic agents? What are the sort of risk or benefit considerations that are applied in these situations? I don't know if you can see okay. them as well, that might help. So, so yes, there are some foods that are more likely to cause anaphylaxis or alternatively, there are some foods that are less likely to cause anaphylaxis. Um, so, for example, egg allergy is an interesting one because, first of all, it comes, it's one of the first allergies that develops um, and it's actually really quite common in babies, um, although often it's limited just to raw egg and most of us don't feed our children raw egg allergy, to eat. Um, but, you know, we know from Australia, one in 10 babies under 12 months of age already have egg allergy. It's probably a tiny bit less in the UK, but not much less. Um, with respect to raw egg and then people tend to outgrow it and even those people who don't outgrow it can often consume egg and cakes and biscuits without having reactions and then even if you can't you generally have a much lower rate of anaphylaxis if when we give you egg under controlled conditions in hospital than other foods such as nuts or milk or so on. Um, nuts are an interesting one um, peanut and cashew pistachio and Brazil nut are often associated more with more anaphylaxis than other foods. Um, but actually, in some people, they have peanut allergy or nut allergies due to their hay fever. That there are certain pollens, particularly pollen from the birch tree, that are similar to some food proteins we find in nuts and other foods. And this is known as pollen food allergy syndrome. And so when these people eat those foods and they have this pollen food allergy syndrome, they develop an itchy mouth, it's hay fever of the mouth, just like getting an itchy nose, it's happening in the mouth and the throat instead. And those people tend to be at lower risk of having anaphylaxis. That's not zero risk, but it's lower risk. Um, but then we've got milk and I've already shown you that milk is probably more common as a cause of anaphylaxis and fatal anaphylaxis than people realise because it's so ubiquitous and you only need a tiny bit of milk to get quite a high protein load. Okay, great, thank you. Um, the next one was with a milk allergy, has the FSA done any work to standardise tests for screening uh, the presence of milk? For example, what type of milk is being screened for lactose, fructose and the test kits recommended? So currently we don't recommend 
analytical techniques such you know ELISAs or those sorts of test kits when it comes to allergen management and there are a number of there are a couple of reasons for that I don't think I've got a huge amount of time now it's another whole talk altogether um, but one is due to the issues of testing that um, for many foods um, the allergen isn't homogeneously distributed it's not like a liquid if you've got a solid food it will be in a lump and you might sample from the bit of the food that doesn't actually have the contamination. And so that's a major issue, what we call heterogeneous or particulate contamination. If you do sample the wrong bit, you aren't actually gonna get a good at rear result. There are lots of other issues with the analytical kit. They might not be sensitive enough. They might not be reliable enough. And with milk, um, arguably the lower limit for the majority of ELISAs at the moment isn't necessarily sensitive enough to pick um, a sort of lower limit whereby we can say you'll be okay if you've got milk allergy because we can't measure milk. There might still be milk protein present but we can't measure it. Milk is easier because often it's milk or ice cream or creams or yogurts and it's a liquid and therefore the allergen is going to be distributed uniformly so then you can do testing but actually what trumps testing is having good controls in place that has compliance and so on so that you know what's coming to the into the production line and where things are heading so you know analytical techniques it has a purpose in policing things in terms of allergen control but what's more important is having good allergen control in the first place in your food business or in the factory. And then I guess the second thing just to highlight is with food allergy, it's the protein you're allergic to, not the sugar. So the vast majority of people with milk allergy can have food grade lactose, no problem, because there's such minimal protein present. And certainly farmer grade pro lactose doesn't have any protein present at all, or shouldn't have any protein present at all. So it's the analytical techniques need to be focused on the proteins and protein chemistry is quite different in many cases um, from, from carbohydrate chemistry for sugars. Great, thank you. So we're getting quite a lot of questions coming through now, so it's oh, need to find the next one. Um, does PAL exist elsewhere in the world um, and what would be a better solution for the UK? So yeah, many countries now um, have precautionary allergen labelling. Um, and, and while in, you would expect that to be a bad thing, interestingly, in certain cultures, um, it's a good thing. So for instance, in Japan, um, the use of crustacea, um, so shellfish in factories, is often associated with a higher quality of food produce. And so it's not uncommon in Japanese foods to say has been made in a factory where we process shellfish, not as an allergen warning, but as a sign of quality. It's quite ironic. Um, so there's quite a lot of work to do there and a lot of cultural sensibility as well that varies from country to country. Um, what we're trying to do in the UK and in many countries in Europe and hopefully spread it out thereafter is try and bring a, a logical process into, um, sorry, I hope you can hear me over the fire alarm test, um, into um, when the manufacturers decide to use an allergen label or not. Now, the general food law says that um, producers have to already provide safe food. Now, is the use of power where you can't justify a misleading claim? Potentially, but that's never been tested in a court so far. Um, and what we need is advice from the regulator level to food businesses to say, do this. And if at the end of doing this properly, this risk assessment properly, it's determined that there is no risk or minimal risk, then you don't need a power. And if that's not the case, then you should use a power. But we're not quite there yet. The FSA, I think, in my experience, among all regulators, is probably leading the field in trying to get there. And I guess despite all the challenges of EU exit, potentially one of the advantages, and I think we probably need to try and clutch at whatever advantages there are, um, is that we are now potentially able to introduce better measures to guide the use of power. But then there's no point in the FSA doing it if we can't get uptake elsewhere in Europe and else uptake elsewhere throughout the world. 
And so it's really important that we drive and we try and push this to happen at a world level. And there are meetings coming up, codex meetings coming up from the FAO for the United Nations and the World Health Organization, where I'm sure this will come up for discussion to try and make things better for allergic consumers. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and the next question was, what's your opinion on the theory that uh, the apparent increase in allergies is related to cleanliness of the environment? So that's an interesting one. Um, the Obviously, the hygiene hypothesis has been put forward um, as a contributor to the apparent increase in allergies. Um, I think we need to be careful what we're talking about here. There's hygiene and there's cleanliness. And, you know, nowadays trying to find hand a gel, especially now, that doesn't uh, contain loads of alcohol and kill all known germs and all the rest of it. Um, you know, even, even washing up liquid, um, you know, this antibacterial nonsense that we now get in cleaning products, it's probably not a good thing generally, you know, we need controlled food handling and careful food handling. That's different from trying to develop a sterile environment in our home. And there's um, there's a um, sort of the friend, um, there's a, the concept of friendly bacteria that actually not all microbiota are bad for us. And then if we grow up in far cleaner environments, potentially we are changing the immune system and potentially skewing it more towards developing allergies. But there's still a huge amount more of work to be done in this area. Great, I'm conscious of time, but there's, I think we've got time for a couple more. Um, so somebody said, did they read correctly that people with milk allergies are at risk of up to 50% of getting a reaction from dark chocolate and only up to 10% for milk chocolate? Is this because people with allergies avoid milk chocolate more? Um, and is it because people think dark chocolate is safer for those with milk allergies? So that was from the FSA allergen service yes. and then the work done on the TNO. So that was just related to those specific two or three products that were tested. So there was a milk chocolate product and there were dark, some dark chocolate products and the potential risk was one in two eating occasions for that specific dark chocolate product and one in ten occasions for that particular milk chocolate product. Um, that cannot be applied across the board to all dark chocolate or all milk chocolate, but from those similar surveys that have been done, we know that around one in three dark chocolate products do still contain remnants of milk contamination because the only way to get rid of milk from a shared production line for chocolate is to shut it down and steam clean it and the majority of manufacturers can't afford to do that and so there is that risk which is why um, certainly one major brand of dark chocolate used to put a warning on their dark chocolate products that said do not eat this if you are have, have milk allergy and they actually listed milk protein in the ingredients as uh, an ingredient despite the fact it wasn't being added and they got forced by the FDA in America to take that back um, because they were trying to do the right thing and they were having people with milk allergy ignore the warning labels. Okay thank you. Um, the next one was living with celiac disease I'm aware that there's potential to pass this on to my children. Do children only get tested if they show signs? Um, and could eating normal food, in inverted commas, um, cause harm to unborn children who may or may not have an allergy or intolerance? So in terms of celiac disease, um, I'm not a gastroenterologist, so I'm not an expert in that area. But the, um, the reliability or accuracy of the testing depends very much on what we call pre-test probability. So if we just used um, the test for celiac disease, particularly the new blood tests, um, as a screening tool for anyone who had a celiac, pair of celiac disease, they don't perform as well. However, what we would say is that we are learning more about the genetic predispositions to celiac disease. 
and that might be a better test in the future. And certainly, if you are a parent of celiac disease and you start noticing issues with growth in your child, it should be flagged up really early. And I would generally um, say, as a, as a paediatrician, that in a child with a parent with celiac disease, keep an eye on the growth. And if there are any concerns with growth, have a very low threshold for testing. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and there was a question, sorry, I missed this one. Um, uh, I think it was related to a question just now. Um, if those allergic individuals are more at risk from allergies to some medicines? Yeah, OK, so so pharma grade um, products generally um, such as lactose um, or soya based um, products generally don't have the protein and so can't cause allergic reactions. We are in a sort of situation in the Europe whereby the European Medicines Agency recommends people with peanut allergy not to consume medicines that contain soya derived products even though those products are refined and therefore don't contain soy protein. And even though the European Food Standards Agency, EFSA, lists those products as being exempted from allergen declaration when present as a food. And so it's part of the issue of different regulators not really talking to each other and not looking at the available evidence for actual risk. So in general, uh, medicines now are very, very safe but there are product warnings out there that are not evidence-based and cause a lot of confusion, unfortunately. Great. Um, in the interest of time, I think I'll just, we'll just take two more. Um, there was one that is, uh, I've heard of a link between latex allergy and allergies to food. Um, do you know much about this? So, um, when people have latex allergy, sometimes it's just latex alone, but sometimes there is cross reactivity between what they're allergic to as part of the latex protein. That's also similar to certain food proteins. And so some examples of this are um, avocados, um, bananas, um, mangoes. Um, oh, you put me on, on, on the spot now. Um, there are a couple of others that literally have, have just disappeared out of, out of my head. Um, the majority of the time, um, people don't have what we call latex fruit pro, uh, allergy. Um, they we think they're just allergic to latex alone, but occasion, but it's not uncommon um, that there can be this sort of cross sensitivity. And so it's one of the things that we would look for in specialist allergy services, um, even though it's not as common as the majority, which is that they just have isolated latex allergy. Great. And the last one was um, with regards to milk, do you see differences between cow's milk, goat's milk and sheep's milk, um, etc.? Is one less likely yeah, to trigger no. reactions? So, um, and so often we have families who go out and buy non cow's milk based products and then their kids react to it. There's a huge amount of cross reactivity. Very occasionally someone is just allergic to cow's milk and not other mammalian milks. But in general, the majority of people are allergic to all milk proteins, unless it's camel milk, but it's not very easy to get <laughs> yep. in this country. The other thing that's very common that catches people out, um, and it's a bone of contention in my life, is that they'll often be, be told it's okay to have lactose free milk products. And actually, as I said before, it's a protein that causes the issue and lactose free dairy products have lots and lots of milk protein in still and again it's an often it, it, a, a common cause of rebound reactions as such people bouncing back is that it been given advice or they thought um, that they could have a lactose free product we've actually had one fatality in the UK because of that um, where that advice was given by an alternative um, health care practitioner um, and that case is currently sort of going through legal processes. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks for answering all of the questions. And that was a really, um, I think we'll all agree that was a really interactive um, presentation and really enjoyable and informative. Thank you very much. It's my, it's my pleasure and thank you for having me. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.